We, of course, are starting our Deuteronomy class tonight, looking at chapters 1 through 3. I know the questions just covered 1, but we want to try to cover 1 through 3, of course. It being 34 chapters means we need to move rather rapidly through the book so we can cover it in a timely manner. All right. Uh, the book of Deuteronomy, of course, written by who? Okay, Moses, right? Uh, there's a couple of references in the Bible um, that point back, of course, to Moses. 2 Kings chapter 14 mentions it. Uh, Acts chapter 3, where Peter's preaching there. He quotes from the book of Deuteronomy and references that that's Moses who's speaking there or who... Uh, uh, had that material or wrote it. Uh, so the Bible itself confirms that Moses wrote the book of Deuteronomy. Of course, he wrote the first five books, sometimes collectively called the Pentateuch, but from Genesis to Deuteronomy. Um, what? How have you often heard this book described? What is it? Second law. Okay, very commonly called the second law. I hate to burst anybody's bubble, but that is not what this book is. Um, that's somewhere along the way, there's a mistranslation out of chapter 17. Somebody picked up it, and they started calling it the second law as opposed to a copy of the law that's talking about there with the kings and stuff. It, it's called in the Hebrew Bible, and really what it is is... Um, these are the words or the book of admonitions. Uh, and really what it is, is Moses is really preaching the law. He's preaching with practical application. Because if you think about it, you read through the book, you don't read what's in Leviticus, right? All the sacrifices, what the priests do, all the rituals that they're to go through. You, none of that's in there. Building of the tabernacle's not in there, things like that. So this really isn't the second giving of the law. This is the preaching of the law. Remember, what's what's going to happen with Moses here? He's being kept from going in the promised land, which means what? What he's going to die. His life and service is going to end. Exactly. He's he knows his time is up. And he takes his time. We don't discount God's hand in this and, and guiding him and inspiring him to preach these things. But it's time for him to lay down his armor. And he's given this one last thing like, here's what y'all need to do and focus on. Right? So it's, it's him preaching through that law. Uh, and it's in a form that scholars say is what's called a covenant text. So it's a superior who is telling an inferior, here's the rules. You follow them, this is what you get. If you don't follow them, this is what you get. And you, know, you see a lot of that, especially in chapter 28. But it's God telling His people, Here, here's what I expect of you. It would be sort of like a parent talking to your children. Here, here's what we expect. We expect you to clean your room. expect you to um, you know, mind your manners, do these kinds of things. And if you don't, Here's what's going to happen. If you do, here's what's going to happen. So it, it's sort of along those lines. But Israel's about to enter Canaan land. Moses is about to um, die and depart this world. Uh, the book can be broken down essentially into three speeches by Moses. Uh, chapters 1 through 4 is one speech. And then 5 on down to chapter 26 and then chapters 27 through 34. We'll get into details of those various things as we go along, but in this study, we just want to do one through three, chapters one through three. And because of the amount of material, we're not going to read verse by verse as I normally try to do in my classes. We're just going to cherry pick some along the way. So let's read Deuteronomy 1 verse 3. Start with who will read that for us? Deuteronomy 1, verse 3. Top. In the 14th year of 
40th year, on the first day of the 11th month, Moses spoke to the children of Israel according to all that the Lord had commanded him to give to them. Okay. So, it starts out giving some relevant facts, kind of talking about their location, talking about the time frame when this happens. Um, how old is Moses at this time? 120. 120. He started with the children of Israel in Egypt at what age? At 80. And this mentions, of course, here, this is the 40th year. This is the idea. They came up out of the land of Egypt. They wandered in the desert. And now here we are in the 40th year. And Moses is beginning to preach these things to the people. Um, who, who is it to whom he's speaking? Children of, Israel. Children of Israel. Any more specific? Or? Hebrews? Who? Was it fled uh, Egypt with him that are out in the desert for years? Okay, there's some who fled. You mean everybody that was over 20? Uh, there you go. Because what did he do with that generation that was over 20? They're all dead. They're all dead, right? Except for, there's, there's an exception of just a few in here, but they're dead. This is a new generation. This is a generation that they saw, there's a fair portion of them that saw what happened in Egypt. They've lived through the desert years and all the things that unfolded there, and now they're standing at the edge of Canaan and getting ready to go in. And so he is in a sense, sort of renewing the covenant with them, sort of emphasizing to them, this is the, he, these are the rules here, and here's what you can expect uh, when you go into that land and how God will be with you, things like that. So he tells them, of course, all that God had commanded them, and again, he's, he's sort of preaching through the law, reemphasizing it and urging them to be obedient to his will. And verses 4 and 5 talk about the fact that there's on the east side of the Jordan. Remember the land of Israel. You've got the Mediterranean Sea on the west. You have the hills and the mountains rising up. And they sort of peak and then they dive down into the Jordan Valley. And then the Dead Sea being the lowest spot. Of course, if I'm not mistaken, the lowest spot on earth is uh, the Dead Sea there. So they're east of that Jordan River Valley. They're encamped over there, getting ready to move on in, which is what Joshua, of course, does, and that's what you read about in the book of Joshua. Uh, let's read verses 6 through 8 now, if we could. Deuteronomy 1, 6 through 8. We'll grab that. Yes. The Lord our God spake out to us in Horeb, saying, You have dwelt long enough in this mountain. Turn you and take your journey and go to the place of the Amorites, all the places uh, now there unto in the plain, in the hills and in the vale, and in the south and by the seaside, to the land of the Canaanites and unto Lebanon, and to the great river, the river Euphrates. Behold, I have set the land before you, go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give unto them and to their seed thereafter. Okay, so he mentions the Lord spoke to us in Horeb. Where is that? Sinai. Yes, Horeb, Sinai, or the Mount of God in the Old Testament are all the same place. Uh, so he's saying back when we were there, when we came out of Egypt, we were there at the base of the mountain. This is what God told us to do. They had spent about a year there. The law had been given there, all those kinds of things. And then they move out, and this is what God had told them to do when they moved out from there. You need to go up, go to, to the Amorites, the people who lived in and in, around Canaan land. So question number one, I'd ask, where did God swear to give the land to their fathers? And I know that's a little vague. I didn't mean where location, but where in the Bible. What was it? Well, uh, Genesis 13 and 26. Oh. Genesis 13, he, uh, he said that, uh, Lord said to Abram, after the law had separated from him, <clears throat> lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are, north and south, or east and westward. 
Call the language and see how it gets in here and says drug. That's one. There's another one. Twenty-six three. I mean, there's more than that. But sure. Twenty-six three. The one that's land, I will be with you and bless you. For two hundred and thirty minutes, I will give these lands, which I will perform the oath, and I will perform the oath, which I swore to Abraham your father. Yeah, he, he repeats that, and that's to Isaac there. Linda, did you have something? I had Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Yes, exactly. He had promised that land. I had 12, 7. Okay, in 12, 7. In fifth, chapter 15, he delineates that land, and he talks more about it in uh, Genesis chapter 28. But here's the thing about it. Here again, it's affirmed those boundaries of where the land, the territory God had promised to His people. What do pre people of the premillennial persuasion say about this land promise? Well, it hasn't that it still hasn't happened. And so they expect at any time that God's going to miraculously transport all Jews from all over the world over into that land, they'll finally fully possess it as He had promised. They say God hasn't kept that promise. Has God kept this promise? Yes. Okay. And it's it, debatable that those Jews are even Jews. The truth they are. There, yeah, I, I understand that. Um, in 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 21 is probably the best place where it's talking about in Solomon's reign in 1 Kings 4, 21... And it talks about these boundaries, and it's talking about the north and south boundaries of the land. You know, Solomon reigned over all the kingdoms from the river. When you see the river in the Old Testament, what do you think of? Euphrates. If you're in the United States and somebody says, go to the river, where do you go? You go to the Mississippi, even if you live near the Ohio, you go to the Mississippi, because that's the river of the United States. So Euphrates is the river to the border of Egypt, and that is a river in the Sinai Peninsula, in the northern Sinai Peninsula. It's always been recognized as the border of Egypt. It's still the border of Egypt today. They brought tribute to Solomon and so on and so forth. So he's talking about north and south rain. And, and Moses here in Deuteronomy is saying, God told us to go up and that land is ours. If we just go in, it's ours. And we have it as a possession. So, let's read now verses 9 through 14. Who will read Deuteronomy 1, 9 through 14 for us? Clint. Then I spoke to you at that time, saying, I alone am not able to bear you. The Lord your God has multiplied you, and here you are today, as the stars of heaven in multitude. May the Lord God of your fathers make you a thousand times more numerous than you are, and bless you as he promised you. How can I alone? and your burdens and your complaints. Choose wise, understanding, and knowledgeable men from among your tribes, and I will make them heads over you. And you answered me and said, The thing which you have told us to do is good. Okay, so let me ask you this. When he says, Here you are today as the stars of heaven in multitude. Why is he making that reference? Okay, Abraham? It was part of the problem. Part of the problem. Look, you're able to count. That's how it's going to be, your descendants. How many people are in Israel right now in, in, when Moses is here talking to them? If you go back and you see in Exodus when they came out of land, they numbered 600 and some odd thousand. You get to the end of the book of Numbers, what's the number? This is men when they get, when they tallied up the men of fighting age. It was the exact same number. They hadn't diminished. God had preserved them. And if you calculate that out with women and children, you get like one and a half to two million or so. So imagine standing in front of a crowd of one and a half million people. What do they look like? They look like the stars of heaven. Look, look at all these people out here. It's just a sea of people. So question number two is why were other leaders appointed and what practical lesson can we draw from it? So, Moses says, hey, we came out, need the leaders, so we appointed leaders over the tribes. Moses 
exhausted in the And he was. You go back to the original account with his father-in-law Jethro there. Jethro's like, what are you doing? Why are you trying to handle all this by yourself? you got to have some help here. And so they went through that process of getting others to help manage the people. Um, what's the lesson for us? Any lesson? Yes. Don't allow yourself to be so overwhelmed there's help available. Okay. There's help available. I'll try to take it off, Zach. I could help but think about God's design for the church today and how the elders uh, I wouldn't go to this text I'll get going in the discussion of appointing elders, but there's some characteristics here for Sir James Wise, discerning, experienced men from among you. Those are five things that are uh, characteristics that we can find equivalencies of or close to enough in First Timothy and Titus uh, that this is this would count as the first form of government aside from God directly governing over man, which he still will from this point forward, as today, of course, but this being the first established man-made, if you will, government, that God's still electing the leaders as he still does the will appoint the elders in this sense, too. So there, there's some similarities there. I can help notice that. Yeah, and usually when we talk about a plurality of elders, what we're talking about is there shouldn't be centralized power in one man over a congregation. And that's what, of course, denominations do. But here it's coming from the perspective of it's too much for one person to handle. There needs to be a division of labor where it's balanced out, where these things can be handled efficiently. Go. So, Even the church, we need to have elders. I mean, all of the duties and the work of the church is, is too much for just the elder thing. Well, that's why they have deacons, and that's why they activate members of the church to help, because that's what they need. Exactly, exactly right. I'm so glad you brought that up. Not only are there a plurality of elders, but there's a plurality of deacons, and they help to take care of the work. You get to the apostles in Acts chapter 6 and the problems that arose there, and they say, look, we can't leave preaching to take care of this, and so you guys find men among you who you trust, you can handle this, who are of faith, things like that. So, yeah, division of labor. And well, also, Paul in Corinthians, when he's talking about each member has their own you know, thing that they can do, that they can do, and we all work together. So, this is just leadership, it's everybody. <laughs> right, exactly. That was the very next thing that I had down there various members of the body coming together for the benefit of the whole. So that's very good, very good. All right, so he talks about this way of governing being set up among the people. Um, let's look at 16 and 17 now, just real briefly here. Deuteronomy 1, 16 and 17. Who will grab that for us? Hang on. Then I commanded your judges at the time, saying, Give the case between your brethren and judge rightly between a man and his brother, or the stranger who is with him. And you shall not show partiality. In judgment, you shall hear the small as well as the great. You shall not be afraid of any man's presence. For the judgment of God. The case that is too hard for you, bring to me, and I will fear it. Okay. So what's happening here? What's he saying they set up in this case? Set up a court. Yeah, essentially a court and you know uh, a system where look if it's too difficult for them, bring you know, eventually bring it to me. But you you, you, you have you, a lower court and he he sits on this let's say supreme he they can't hear, don't want to hear, don't understand, bring it to him. Okay. Um here's here's a principle in here. Handle the problem at the lowest level it can be handled. And isn't that what we're taught in Matthew chapter 18? If, if you and I have a problem, let's, let's you and me work it out. You don't need to take it to everybody right away. If we can't work it out, let's involve a couple more people. If they can't, if that doesn't get worked out, then take it before the church. But handle it on the smallest level, the lowest level, smallest number of people involved, 
as quickly as possible. But of course, they have to deal with things. They're, they're people. They're going to have problems. They're going to have disagreements. They're going to have to have judgments made. And so they've set it up to, to be able to take care of that. Now, pressing on, 19 and following here, we're not going to read all of this, but you know, he gets into, when they went up to the land of Canaan, the fact that they didn't go in, they should have gone in, and all the problems that unfolded from that. And I ask you to review Numbers 13 and 14 where that original account is to handle these questions. So question number three, and we'll just plow through these. What was good about the land and what was bad about the land? So what was good? Filled with milk and onions. Everything you needed. Milk and onions. Anybody ever been over there to Middle East, the land of Israel? Yeah, I, I went there in 2008. Pat, you've been there. Okay. Years ago. Hey, years ago. Hadn't changed. I promise you. Oh, two years ago. Two years. Ago. Hadn't changed since Bible times. I promise you that. <laughs> okay. Uh, everything you read about here, you go over there and see. You, I understand why the children of Israel complained out in the Sinai Desert. It is an utterly desolate place. I, I understand that complaining. Comparatively speaking, from Sinai into Canaan land, that's a land of milk and honey. You, you've got vegetation and everything there. You don't just have rock and sand. You have water flowing with the Jordan. And just it, it's different. So it's a land flowing with milk and honey. Talked about the grapes. What? How? How great were the grapes? Does anybody remember? Two men had to put a cluster of grapes on poles and carry it between them. That's how heavy that cluster of grapes was. So. There, there, were, there was food plentiful there. It was a good land, houses and cities and wells and all these things. So what was bad about the land? The people. Okay. That was a trick question. Nothing! That was the whole point. He was telling them that you should have gone in. There was no problem there. You just didn't have the faith to do it. Sorry, I get excited yeah. about that. They were just afraid of the, the giants. Yeah, so in... Yes, if you were to look at it just from a human perspective, which is what they were doing, the, the, the cities have the walls, they're strong, there's giants in there, oh, we're like grasshoppers in their sight. But the reality was, there was nothing bad about that land. When God told them to go in, they should have just gone in Jeff. Well, what I mean by, that, by the people is that they didn't get rid of all the people. Oh yeah, when they eventually go in, of course, it's after this, yeah, yeah. If you fast forward a, a good while here, yeah, exactly. They didn't get rid of all of them. Um, question number four. How did the report of the spies affect the congregation and what lesson can we learn from this? What did the ten spies say? It was too much for them to overcome. So they discouraged the people into disobedience. Okay. What, what did they say about God? Uh, Deuteronomy 1.27 And you complained in your tents and said, Because the Lord hates us, He has brought us out of the land of Egypt to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. What about that? God, God is one to get rid of us because they're so big. We can't, we can't fight. So what, what did the report of the ten spies do? Discouraged. Discouraged. Second guess God? They just thought, oh, we can't do it. That's it. Just give up. Yeah. Well, it went beyond that. They said, let's choose a leader and go back to Egypt. They, yeah. They, that was a mutiny right then and there. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it, it seemed to be a report problem with the children of Israel. Let's, let's get another leader. Let's get another leader. Um, and they wanted to go back. So, what's the lesson here for us? Fear. 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 
keep us from doing what we're supposed to do. Fear can keep us from doing what we're supposed to do. Anything else? What's that? Negativity can be contagious. Most definitely. Negativity, the discouragement, the complaining, the murmuring. You know, Philippians has something to say about do all things, what? Without complaining, disputing, without complaining, and murmuring. Hank? Fear, fear is like a cancer. Without God, it just grows and grows and grows. Right. And from your experience in the military, what happens to a unit when that negative mindset takes hold? Unity breaks apart when you allow naysayers, negativity. Uh, yeah. If you, you cannot, if you don't trust it, if you don't trust the guy in front of you next to you, you're not going to make it. Yeah. If, if, if their head isn't in it and their heart isn't in it, you, you know there's trouble ahead. The companies know that. Military knows that. The Bible here has, has shown that for thousands of years. You have to have your, your mind and your spirit in it. You have to be aligned in it. And if you start getting those negative attitudes and that discouragement, it just breathes and it spreads and it goes further to where they don't get to enjoy God's blessing because of it. And they turn against God Himself, Chris. Well, fear will consume you, number one, if you let it know cause animosity mm -hmm. and it'll cause you at times to be rebellious. Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly what happened with these people. Exactly. Completely ruined it. Um, now then, question number five, I asked who urged the people to enter the land and what did they say? Caleb. Caleb and Joshua. What did they tell the people? We can do it. Yeah, we can do it. Does anybody remember specific words they used? That we are well able. We are well able to overcome. It's, it's not a question. It's not like, I think we can make it. We've got God with us. He's on our side. We are well able to go in there. I don't care how tall they are. I don't care what kind of walls they have around their cities. We can go in and we can do it. And isn't that the kind of attitude you need in leaders? Like, yeah, there's an obstacle there. Whatever. We're, we're doing God's will? We'll just roll right over that. And we'll get it done. Any other thoughts there? What do the people want to do with Joshua and Caleb? Does anybody remember that? They wanted to stone them. <laughs> the guys who are the most positive, encouraging guys... They want a stone. Yeah. Well, that, that creeps up among brethren sometimes, too. All right. Let's press on. Um, Hebrew, or Deuteronomy 1, 32 and 33. What does he say there? Um, Deuteronomy 1, 32, 33. Who will read that for us? Go ahead. Yet in spite of this word, you did not believe the Lord your God. Who went before you in the way to seek out, to seek you out a place to pitch your tents, in fire by night and in a cloud by day, to show you by what way you should go. Okay. So he tells them the exact reason why they couldn't go in. Verse 32. You did not believe the Lord. Do you remember the Hebrew writer reviewing this over in Hebrews chapter 3? They could not enter in because of unbelief. And then what does the Hebrew writer use that for? He's warning us, be careful. Be careful. You, should, you fall in that same trap of unbelief. Won't be able to go into heaven, into the rest of heaven. Exactly. Alright, so for the rest of Deuteronomy chapter 1, essentially he reviews the failed invasion, talks about the fact they're doomed to die 
They were doomed to die in the wilderness. Those, of course, who are dead by the time he's preaching this. But he's reminding them, look, look what this generation before you did. Look what the results were. You need to be mindful of that. It was a problem. Um, the only ones who were able to go in, of course, Caleb and Joshua, the children who survived it. You know, it's very interesting. And, and the Lord talked about this when He told them they were going to die in the wilderness. And, because they were saying, you brought us and our children out here to die. And he said, well, those children that you said were going to die, they're going to be the ones that go into the land of Canaan and not you. So God kind of just sticks it right to them about your, your unbelief. This is what it's doing for you. Um, and of course, they all died. They're barred from entering in. They wander around in the wilderness. Uh, but what happened when Israel was told... You can't go in. What they do back in the original account, and Moses reviews it here. Philip didn't mean that God would change their mind. And when they tried, what happened? Thoroughly defeated. Exactly. Any lesson there? Well, didn't God command them to go in? Couldn't they make the argument? Well, God commanded us to go in. So we're going to go in now. But God gave another command. He told them you can't go in. Any lesson there? When God in the Old Testament says there needs to be a priesthood, here's the special garments that they have, and in the New Testament He says all believers are priests, what do we do? You always follow your last standing word. Thank you. There's a change of the covenant, right? Hebrews 7 talks about there's a change of the law. So many of our friends and neighbors, they want to go back, they want to look at the Old Testament, they want to find instrumental music, they want to find observing the Sabbath, or whatever's back there, and they say, well, that's what we want to do. Well, God's given another command, and that's the command that is valid. Here's a great illustration of that. He said, go into the land. People said, no. God said, well, you're not going in then. And, oh, well, we're, let's, let's go try it. They could not argue, well, God told us, gave us a command to go in the land. Well, yeah, that was before, but now he's telling you you can. They end up being defeated in it. Answer. It, it, when I read through this, I, the scripture that came to mind was, Behold the goodness and the severity of God. That wraps it up right there. The goodness was offered, but they chose the severity. Exactly, exactly. And another thing that shows us is, Repentance, no matter how earnest, doesn't mean you won't face consequences. Even when we are sorry for the sin we've committed and we've been forgiven of that sin, doesn't mean we don't have issues to deal with now. Because these people could have been forgiven of rebelling against God but they still had to face the fact they're wandering in the wilderness. There's no getting out of that. And sometimes that's how it is for us. We, we repent of a sin and we get forgiveness, but we still have to deal with consequences. Their, their lack of uh, belief and faith is the same thing that we face today. These people don't believe. The ones who do believe, their faith wavers. They wonder why, why, why things are going on. Right. It all comes down to belief. You know, that's why the Bible emphasizes belief. Because true belief, true conviction leads to action. Right? It leads to obedience to God. And if, if we're not obeying God, what it comes down to is we really don't believe what He's saying. Somehow we rationalize in our mind, it's okay not to do what God has told us to do or I'm going to be the exception, or some way, somehow. 
Steve, I was just going to say, in the context of what you're explaining, it, it makes that emphasis to us that God's approval is essential in any action to determine whether it's right or wrong. And the situational changes do not make that action right, as you just described here. Under one condition, it was right. Under the next condition, it was wrong. It was the same thing, mm -hmm. but God authorized it, and he approved it, and then he did not. Right. And it didn't matter how they felt about it. It didn't matter how passionately they wanted it. He said, no, it, that was it. No. Very good. All right. Uh, chapters 2 and 3. Let's um, sort of hop, skip, and jump through here. He, he reviews their journey uh, from Kadesh Barnea to the Transjordan. So in that first part is where they came up from Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai. They went up to Kadesh Barnea, which is on the southern end of the land of Canaan, land of Israel. They refused to go in, and so they then have those years of wandering until they reach this point where he's speaking to them in Deuteronomy, and they're on the east side of Jordan, which is called Transjordan. So they're over there on the east side, and he's just kind of going through the various things that got them to that very high level uh, review of things. So they go through Edom's territory, uh, which is, you know, Seir, and that's Esau's descendants. He says, be cautious when you go through. Don't meddle with them. Don't cause any problems. That, that territory is given to Esau. Uh, then they come to Moab's territory. And who, who significant in the Bible is related to Moab? Lot. Who's, who's, what's the connection? His children with his daughters. Yeah, you remember what happened with Lot and his daughters after Sodom and Gomorrah. And his oldest daughter had a boy named Moab. And these are his descendants. So the, these are their distant relatives. Um, but that's who, that's who Moab is. And then Ammon. Who's Ammon related to everyone here? The other daughter, the younger daughter, had a child and... Ammon, the Ammonites are descendants of her, uh, of that child. Um, talks about this dispossession of the nations. Let's read chapter 2, verses 20 to 23, please. Deuteronomy 2, 20 to 23. Who will read that for us? Plan. That was also regarded as a land of giants. The giants formerly dwelt there. But the Ammonites called them Zamzumim. The people as great and numerous and tall as the enemy. The Lord destroyed them before them, and they dispossessed them and dwelt in their land and their place. Just as he had done for the descendants of Esau who dwelt in Seir, when he destroyed the Horites from before them, they dispossessed them and dwelt in their place even to this day. And the Aven who dwelt in villages as far as Gaza, Aftorum, who came Aftorum, destroyed them and dwelled in their place. Okay. He's reviewing some of this, some of what they've been through and going through, you know, Moab, going through Ammon, things like that. But also right here he's he's pointing out to them God's in control and what happened in these lands before is what you are about to do in Canaan. You're about to go in and dispossess these people of the land they're in. And God's the one who wants that to happen, wants that to take place. So Israel then, they run into Sihon, they run into Og, and what happens with Sihon and Og? Okay, they're defeated. In what way? To what extent? How about verses 33 through 35. Who will read that for us? Deuteronomy 2, 33 to 35. Okay, go. And the Lord our God delivered him over to us, so we defeated him, his sons, and all his people. We took all his cities at the time, and we utterly destroyed the men, women, little ones of every city. 
we left none remaining, we took only the livestock as plunder for ourselves to the spoil of the cities which we took. So to what extent did they defeat Sihon? Completely they slaughtered them all. And they took all their stuff. And of course they're going to be they're given territory over here. Uh, chapter 3, verses 3 and 4, he kind of repeats the same thing regarding Og. Remember, Sihon and Og were on the east side of the Jordan. It was the west side that was the promised land. But on the east side, when they run into these problems with Sihon and Og, and they defeat them in battle. They are then granted that land. Who was it that possessed that land on the east side of Jordan? What part of Israel? You got the G right. Yeah. Yeah. Reuben, Gad, and half tribe of Manasseh. Manasseh was a massive tribe. Um, and so they actually ended up splitting up east and west side of Jordan. But yeah, Reuben, Gad, and the half tribe of Manasseh asked for that land. They were granted that land. But what did they have to do? Deuteronomy 3, verse 18. What were they required to do? Yeah, you you got to send troops over there with us to take the land of Canaan, and then you can come back and settle in here. So yeah, so they're granted that, but you still have to go in and fight with us. You you can't sit this one out. Um, so then uh, let's read twenty and twenty one. Uh, Deuteronomy three twenty and twenty one. Who'll read that for us? Exactly. Until the Lord have given rest unto your brother. I'm sorry, twenty one and twenty two. Joshua at that time, saying, Thine eyes have seen all the Lord your God hath done unto these two kings. So shall the Lord do unto all the kingdoms, whither thou passest. Ye shall not fear them, for the Lord your God, he shall fight for you. Okay. So an exhortation for Joshua. Did Joshua need that with what he was looking at? Yeah, yeah he's got he's got to go in and take this huge territory, comparatively speaking. I know for us, Israel is rather small, right? I forget the, the equivalency in the United States, how big it is offhand, but still a big territory. People have dug in. They know they're big people. They know they have the walled cities, all those kinds of things. Um, but he says, look, just like the Lord did with Sihon and Og, he's going to do with them. You be faithful to him. You do his will. Go in. He'll deliver these others into your hand. So Israel is being exhorted here to enter the land with that huge challenge ahead of them. They needed the reassurance. They need the admonition. And they need to build up confidence as they go through. And of course, as they have victories, they're going to have confidence going through. Let's read verses 23 to 29 now, closing out chapter 3. Deuteronomy 3, 23 to 29. We'll grab that. Philip? Then I plead with the Lord at that time, saying, The Lord God, you have begun to show your servant your greatness in your mighty name. For what God is there in heaven or on earth who can do anything like your works and your mighty deeds? I pray, let me cross over and see the good land beyond Jordan, those pleasant mountains in Lebanon. But the Lord was angry with me on your account and would not listen to me. So the Lord said to me, Enough of that. Speak no more, speak no more to me in this matter. Go up top of Pisgah, and lift, up, lift your eyes toward the west, the north, the south, and the east. Behold it with your eyes, for you shall not cross over this Jordan. But command Joshua, and encourage him, and strengthen him. For he shall go over before this people, and he shall cause them to inherit the land which he will see. So he stayed in the valley opposite of that people. Okay. Well, what's the occasion here? Just let's summarize this and Pull a couple of lessons out of here. So, Moses pleading with God again just to delay, you know, delay the cross over the field, just to see the Why? Why was he forbidden to do that? 
was he disobeyed God? Is the incident of the rock? Yeah. He, he struck the rock instead of speaking to it. Uh, that's another occasion where God before told him to strike it, and this time he told him to speak it. And the people were just aggravated. People got under his skin. And he, he struck that rock and he said, Must I give you rebels water? So there, there's a sense in which he's like me, instead of keeping the focus on God. God said, Moses, you crossed a line here. You're, now you're not going into Canaan. And Moses comes back here, please. Yeah, please, Jeff. I think they would have worshipped him if they had found his tomb. You know, this is my personal opinion. Well, they were worshiping that snake, but <laughs> you know, exactly. They they did worship the snake. So here, here's the thing about it: that here Moses is pleading with God. One thing is, you. At least I read this here, and Moses is very bold with God. Let me go in. And what does God have to respond with? In the New King James, at least, in verse 26, speak to me. Enough of that. That's it. Don't want to hear another word about it. Any parents ever get to that point? That's it. We're done talking about it, Philip. But based on God's response, it kind of at least leads me to think that this is not the first or second time that Moses has approached this topic of God. Yeah, he's and here he's saying no, just flat out no, Clint. Like Nancy, you pointed out before, the goodness and severity of God. Moses, you can't go in. Sorry, you worked really, really hard to get people here. Great. I've got something better for you. Don't worry about it. You can't go in there, but you're going to come with me to heaven. Okay. Yeah. There, there's so much in this, and then at the end of the book, of course, we're going to read about Moses' death, so we'll, we'll save hopefully a lot of it for then, Lord willing, when we get to it. But here, let me ask you this. Was Moses right with God at this point. He's right with God. This isn't God telling him, you're in sin, Moses. I'm condemning you forever because you've asked again to go in. That's not what this is. This is Moses just, you know, in his heart, in his soul. Think about everything he's been through and looking forward to this. And he's right at the edge. And he can't go in. And God still says, no, Moses, you, you can't do that. There, there may be things in our life that we want and we want them desperately bad, but God in His providence is telling us no. No. And every so often, I don't know if you've experienced it, but every so often, He's, he's in His providence now. I'm not saying God's speaking to me, but in His providence, it's just like enough. It makes it impossible and then you finally accept that and you move on. Phil, you have something else? Moses knew from his dealings with the people of Israel and with God at this point that God can change his mind because he's done. Because God told him to get out of the way and kill everybody and make a great nation. And Moses kind of stood in the way and said, no, and God relented. Mm -hmm. So you kind of get the sense coming. So Moses knows that. So he's hoping God will be in. I don't want to read too much into it, but that's what it's saying. Right, right. He, know, he knows God hears his prayer and his plea, and God is a compassionate and merciful God. In this case, though, God said, no, my mind's made up, you're not going in. Uh, and there's a whole lot more to that with, of course, Joshua taking over and various things, but yeah. All right, so, Lord willing, let's pick up next week, next lesson, beginning chapter 4, moving forward. Thank you all.